Welcome. Uh, in this lecture, we're concerned about the literature review and the learning objectives are that first we have to appreciate uh, what the literature review is and how that plays a role in management and business research uh, and what specifically that role is. The second learning objective is to learn uh, the practical skills that are needed for us to search in a better way identify the relevant information, and then create records for ourselves about the different literature that we are capturing so that we can try to uh, develop an understanding of how to then evaluate these different sources of information, how to evaluate the arguments that are presented in these different sources of information, uh, and begin to structure our uh, write-up so that we can sit down and then write our literature review. So these are the three objectives. Now, the very first thing that we're concerned about is the different types of literature that exist. So if we look around us, we'll find that there are many different sources of literature. Some of them are more important for us as opposed to the other sources of information or the other sources of literature. Nonetheless, these are the different types of sources of literature that are there. So for example, newspaper articles are sources of literature, uh, magazines are sources of literature, uh, websites, government reports, non-governmental reports, um, Publications made by different bodies related to different uh, professions are uh, sources of literature. Books are sources of literature. Uh, in addition to that, we have edited books in which we have book chapters. So those are also sources of literature uh, and so on and so forth, right? So there are many different sources or types of literature that exist, uh, but we can sort of branch them into two categories. The first is what we call as the peer-reviewed literature, and the other would be what we can term as the gray literature, that is, it is non-peer-reviewed. So, of course, we're going to give more value to the peer-reviewed literature as opposed to gray literature, because this is that particular set of literature that has gone through a process of being uh, vetted and analyzed by people that belong to the same uh, area of expertise that the writer did. And these people are the gatekeepers of the discipline. So in the peer review process, that article would have gone in front of one or two reviewers who would have reviewed um, not only the literature presented, but the theoretical framework, the research questions, the methodology, and the findings, etc. And they would have agreed that the uh, literature study, uh, sorry, the research study has been done in the right manner, uh, and the findings are valid. Uh, therefore, uh, these articles get published. So these are the peer-reviewed articles, and we value them uh, more as opposed to gray literature, which does not go through uh, much of a peer review uh, process. So we sort of uh, put our, um, uh, what can we call it? We put our, uh, uh, our confidence in the peer reviewed articles more than on any other sources of literature. But that does not mean that the gray literature is irrelevant because the peer-reviewed articles take a little bit of time to get published. So by the time the article gets published uh, and we get to read it, it's already a bit old. So if we want to get more of the state of the art and we want to know what is happening in, in contemporary society right at that particular point in time, so then the gray literature is quite helpful in that case also, right? So um, I'm not suggesting that we don't have gray literature in our literature review. What I'm suggesting is that we rely more on the peer reviewed, but then along with that, we can have some uh, gray literature included as well. Now, the types of literature review are quite varied. There are more than, I think, 30 different types of literature reviews that can be done. And it all depends upon what is the purpose behind doing that literature review. 
is that, that we're trying to find out the status quo and what is going on in a particular topic of interest for us. Is it that, that we're trying to find out what has been done and what is remaining to be done? Is it that, that we're trying to uh, sort of uh, put to, to rest uh, some sort of a discrepancy that exists within the literature where different voices are present and now we're confused as to what to do, right? So there's various different uh, uh, types of literature reviews that are possible, but for our purposes, we'll say that there's three different types of literature reviews. One is what we call as a traditional literature review, um, and this would be uh, basically a literature review that we do uh, at the MS and PhD levels where we look at existing literature to find out what has been done so that we can figure out also what is left to be done uh, and then we can go about posing our research questions and um, collect our empirical evidences uh, to address these questions, right? So one uh, main type of literature review that we become concerned with or are concerned with is the traditional literature review. And that uh, this type of literature gives rise to the rest of the research study. There is another type of uh, literature review as well, which is called uh, standalone literature review. Now you'll find standalone literature reviews mostly in journals that publish uh, just literature reviews. And the purpose of these literature reviews is to bring forward in some sort of a summarized and synthesized manner what all has been written about a particular topic of interest. After this, there is no uh, additional work to be done. That is, there's no more research questions. There's nothing to go and collect data about. Basically, the purpose of a standalone literature review is to collect existing literature, analyze it, and present uh, the, the layout of that discipline and say, here's what has been said about a particular topic area so far. And the third type of a literature review that we also encounter sometimes is what is called as a systematic literature review. And if you remember, we had done a bit of an exercise in the class uh, on how to do a systematic literature review. So I'll, I'll be quite brief about it, but a systematic literature review uh, normally has a particular purpose behind it. And that purpose is that the researcher finds that there are a variety of voices that exist in the literature. Some are saying one thing, and others are saying something else. So there's contradictory views that exist uh, within the literature. So the purpose of this type of a literature review, a systematic one, is to basically put to rest this uh, variety of opinions and figure out what is the unified voice that exists within the literature that has been um, published by different people, right? So a systematic literature review also does not have a follow-up study behind it. That is a systematic literature review, um, we can say differs from the traditional literature review in that the systematic literature review normally begins with a research question and it finishes by addressing that question. Uh, there is no more field work necessary. A traditional literature review, however, does not begin with a research question, rather it begins with a research problem, and then it moves into the formulation of research questions that are then uh, you know, looked uh, at uh, by collecting empirical evidence, analyzing it, and addressing these questions. And the standalone literature review, as a recap, is basically just a literature review which tells us what uh, we know about a particular uh, topic of interest for ourselves, right? So there's three different types of literature review. Now, what does a literature review do? Well, it uh, doesn't do a single thing. It does multiple things for us. One is that helps us um, to learn from previous studies uh, and we get to, to know what others have done, how they have done it, why they have done it in that particular way, and where have they gotten their information from. And then more so also, 
how they have analyzed their data and what are their findings. So we can learn from other people and then that can help us to structure our own research and maybe also to identify uh, some uh, problem areas that are still left for us to explore. And so this is what a literature review does, is that it helps us to learn from previous studies. The second thing that a literature review does is that it provides a context for our research project and helps us to refine our own topic. So we begin with a vague idea, we look at the literature, and as we read more and more and more, our topic becomes more and more refined, and the context for our study becomes more and more refined as well. So we have, uh, as, as a consequence of doing the literature review, a more uh, all-encompassing holistic type of a study that looks at all the uh, different types of perspectives that need to be taken into account, right? Um, the third thing that a literature review does is that it highlights maybe uh, the flaws that exist in previous research. So maybe as an example, I have uh, encountered this one research study which was published in 1973 and it had uh, collected data from information technology projects that were taking place predominantly in Europe and in the United States and they came up with certain findings and later on nobody questioned the study and all uh, the publications that happened afterwards were generalizing and saying well this is what is happening in all types of organizations and all types of situations regardless of where they are uh, geographically or regardless of what sector they belong to. So I felt uh, for my own study that that was a flaw or a flaw that existed where people were accepting something as a generalization where it wasn't, right? So that identified to me a particular gap that I could pursue uh, in Pretty much this is what I did in my PhD study, right? So had I not reviewed the literature, had I not been critical of what was being said in that previous literature, I would perhaps uh, skip the gap. So once that uh, major gap was identified, then I could uh, zoom in on the studies that uh, related closer to that gap to find out what specifically uh, was said about that particular topic of interest and what type of questions were still left to be answered. So these were the questions that I could pose for my research study and then go and collect uh, data for it and analyze it and answer these questions. Right? Now, what else the literature review does is that it indicates what a research project is adding to the understanding of the field, right? So this is an important consideration because, uh, you know, my supervisor was quite concerned about uh, this issue as well, and he would keep asking me this question, how is your research study better than the previous researches that have existed? How is your study different than other researches that have been conducted and so on and so forth? So it basically helps you to uh, sort of understand the field better and uh, uh, sort of uh, gives you uh, some information about how your research study is going to be uh, novel or different than a previous research study, right? So it's, it's going to be quite boring if you just take an existing study and reproduce it, and all uh, that you're doing in that case is that you're perhaps saying, well, I changed the data set. So instead of looking at people in the United States, I looked at people in Pakistan. Well, then somebody else could come and say, well, oh, Pakistan as a whole is too much, so I'm going to look at particularly uh, that sector in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or something of that nature, right? So uh, where is the novelty, right? So there, this is the idea that the literature review helps you to uh, identify how your research study is going to be different and novel. Um, the fifth thing that a literature review does is that it provides you with a justification of why your study should be conducted or why it should be undertaken, right? So there must be some reason uh, for, for that study, for your study to exist. Uh, what is that reason? 
what is the problem statement what is the gap area that you have identified so that all adds to the justification of conducting your own research study and the sixth thing is that it ensures that the research uh, that you are conducting fits into the wider research thought that exists right so if all the writers in your particular topic area are are concerned about a particular uh, concern um, and they're all saying that this is how certain things are happening and you come into the picture and you say something completely different so does that fit in uh, definitely it does not right so we have to understand the major thought pattern the paradigm that's being followed by all the writers in your discipline so that we can fit our research study into that uh, scheme of things right so this is what the literature review is doing for us now i've placed here on the screen for us a definition that's been provided by chris hart in which he uh, in 2005 defines uh, what a literature review is so i'll read it for you he says that a literature review is the selection of available documents on the topic right so there is going to be a process of uh, selection of uh, different types of uh, reading material, both published or unpublished, peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed, right? And then you are going to look at this um, uh, these documents because they contain information, ideas, data, and evidences that are written from a particular standpoint to achieve an aim or to express certain views on the nature of the topic and how it is to be investigated and the effective evaluation of these documents in relation to the research proposed right so there's a lot going on in this lit uh, literature review process uh, not only are we selecting not only are we collecting not only are we analyzing and we are also preparing our research study and putting it into a particular context so that we can go and collect the data and then come up with our findings and uh, address the research questions that we are uh, posing. So this is quite a holistic definition that exists of a literature review. Now, when do you do a literature review? Well, that's a, a tough question to answer uh, because it sort of depends upon what type of a methodology that you are going for. Now, I'll say that with a pinch of salt because not all of us are going to go for that alternative uh, methodology. Uh, normally, if you're doing a research study, whether you're doing an experiment, you're doing a survey-based study, a simulation and modeling-based study, a case study methodology, an archival data research, you know, an ethno methodology and ethnography or whatever have you you will first of all do your literature review and then move into the next steps right however if you're doing a grounded theory methodology so then in that case only the literature review is not going to be the first step right so in the normal traditional uh, research methodologies that exist the very first step is the literature review in that research process. However, in the context of the grounded theory, the literature review is not the first step, rather data collection is the first step. So in a grounded theory methodology, the uh, writers of grounded theory suggest that we first go into the field, collect some data, come home, analyze that data, come up with some concepts that are of you know occurring within that data set then look at the literature reformulate new concepts and themes go back to the field collect more data come back analyze that data again do literature review go back to the field again and come back analyze the data do more literature review and so forth so in a grounded theory the literature review is not the first step rather it is the second step uh, the, um, the fourth step, the sixth step, um, and it goes in, in iterations. There is this constant cycle of going into the field, 
collecting uh, data, analyzing it, um, and then reviewing more literature and coming up with new uh, themes and concepts, going out, collecting uh, data again, coming back, doing literature review again, right? So uh, we'll keep that uh, in mind when we're thinking about where the literature review uh, occurs in a research process, but normally I think most of us will not be going for the grounded PD methodology. So in that case, the literature review is going to be uh, the very first step for us. But uh, it doesn't mean that the literature review once conducted uh, stops, right? As you review your literature, you will slowly move towards the identification of your gap and then putting it into a pictographic type of a form in the sense of a theoretical or a conceptual framework, and then posing your research questions and going out to the field. But that doesn't mean that the literature review stops right there because there is going to be a sufficiently uh, long time that is going to elapse between the time that you stop writing your literature and uh, by the time you collect your data and analyze, right? And, and finally finalize your research thesis uh, where it becomes ready for submission. But by that time, your literature review is left behind uh, six, seven months or a year, right? Depending upon uh, the nature of the study that you're doing, whether it's a ethnographic study or whether it's a PhD level study or MS level study, the gap is going to vary. But nonetheless, the literature is going to be a little bit dated by the time you get ready to submit your research uh, thesis. So that means that, you know, as time is progressing, we're still going to be keeping an eye on uh, literature and new findings that are coming out. So we will integrate the more uh, contemporary literature into our uh, literature review um, before we submit our uh, publication uh, or our thesis to the relevant departments or journals, what have you, right? So it is an ongoing process, uh, but the brunt of it or the majority of it occurs well at the beginning of the research study. And how does it place in this research process? Well, uh, it's the first step, but it's one of the more important steps because it uh, you know, helps you to identify what has been said. It helps you to formulate your, uh, find your gap, formulate your framework and your research question. So basically your entire research study uh, stands on the shoulder of your literature review. So we have to take it quite seriously. Now, um, as I said, there's different types of uh, literature that exist. And we said, well, there's peer reviewed and then there's gray literature. Uh, but we have to evaluate all these uh, sources of information that uh, we are going to be encountering. We have to ask certain questions, for example, or we should have certain concerns in our mind. Uh, as an example, one of the concerns is, what is the purpose of that particular article that we are looking at or that particular um, source of information, right? Why was this uh, thing written? So maybe if we're looking at some sort of a document about a particular machine that has been written by the company that made that machine. So of course, the purpose of that write-up is to either talk about the features of that machine or to talk about efficiency level of it or something of that nature. Uh, in, in a way, what I'm saying is that is uh, marketing collateral and is only going to bring uh, in front of us uh, the value in that product or the goodness that exists in that product. It's not going to engage with us and tell us about uh, some of the shortcomings of that product. Right, so we have to think if it's a marketing material, it has a particular purpose. If it is a peer reviewed article, it has another purpose. If it's a government report, it has a different uh, purpose and so forth. So we have to uh, look at these and, and uh, sort of question, what is the purpose uh, that led to um, the, the writing of that particular piece of information? Uh, the second thing that we have to be concerned about when we're evaluating sources of information is the authorship. Uh, basically, who are the people who wrote this? Right? Uh, as an example, if we have uh, a particular uh, 
sort of a professional group uh, or we've got an NGO uh, and they have written something. Uh, so should we take that uh, to be the absolute truth or should we wonder who are these people that are writing this? Do these people possess certain authority? Are they, uh, you know, people that we can trust and rely upon? Uh, are they professors and good uh, universities and do they po possess the relevant qualifications, etc., uh, in that particular field of expertise and so forth, right? So that will help us to sort of uh, gauge a little bit whether we should be including that source of information into our literature review or not. Right? Uh, the third thing that we are looking at is credibility and accuracy. Uh, basically, is the information credible? Uh, is the information coming from a source that we can rely upon? Uh, for example, if there's a report that's written by the World Bank Organization or the International Monetary Fund or the World Health Organization, can we rely on that source? Is that a credible source? Uh, are the authors providing us with sufficient information uh, that will help us to evaluate the claims that they're making? or are they hiding something from us, right? So we're concerned about that. Uh, we're also wondering if that publication has been through the peer review process. So if it has, then we can rely more upon it. If it hasn't, then we have to be a bit more cautious about uh, including that into our study. Uh, what kind of biases did these authors or writers have and have they controlled for these biases, right? And if they have, how have they controlled for them? Uh, have they done it in the right manner or not? And how accurate and how, um, you know, uh, collective is that information? So all these things contribute towards the credibility and accuracy of the information that is available to us. Uh, and based upon that, we're either going to decide to include that into our literature review or reject it. And the last idea in evaluating these sources of information is the idea of timeliness. Uh, when was this information uh, gathered? When was it analyzed? And when was it published? So can we, as an example, rely on studies that took place in the 1960s uh, and say, well, okay, that information is still valid and these findings are still valid or not, right? Uh, has anybody bothered to update the findings? Has anybody bothered to uh, uh, collect additional information to sort of uh, ensure that this, um, these findings are robust enough and they're still valid? And and all that, right? So these are four different concerns that we should have in our mind when we are evaluating the different sources of information that exist for us, right? Now, the literature review process is, uh, is, is not a, sort of like a, um, a left to right type of a process that begins with one box and moves to the next box and the next and terminates. Rather, there's a lot of back and forth that happens. Right, uh, but the process can be written down in sort of a, um, a structured way. And we can say, well, okay, the first step for us is to identify uh, or review uh, articles related to a particular topic. Right? Uh, sorry, uh, to identify or review the topic that we're coming up with. Uh, setting the scope of our study and setting the aim of our study. Right? So maybe we can uh, do that as the very first step uh, because there's so much information out there. So what information should I specifically be looking at? Uh, so if I've got some topic area, some scope, you know, or uh, some sort of a direction, that will help, right? Now I can uh, look at some initial uh, literature and that can help me to formulate certain keywords, and these keywords can then uh, help me to sort of direct my searches. So that would be the first step. The second step would be to search the relevant literature. So you will go into the different types of uh, databases that exist, for example, Scopus or Emerald or ProQuest or the Thomson um, Web of Knowledge, etc. And we'll put in 
our keywords or topics in there or authors names uh, and based upon that we're going to uh, search for the relevant literature once the literature has been found uh, then the next job is a little bit more difficult where we have to record what we have found and organize the literature into different folders and different theme areas and different concern points and so forth so that we can start thinking about how to uh, structure our writing and how to tell uh, our reader what we have found. Right? The fourth step is then to read uh, these uh, sources of information that we have found, that we have selected, uh, once we have recorded and organized them, uh, we're going to start reading. And then uh, we have to keep certain notes with ourselves about what we have read and what we have understood uh, to, to exist within that literature, right? And then the la last step of the literature review process is to finally sit down and write your literature review. Now, how do we start our uh, review process, right? Um, the literature review should always follow the aims of your study. So it's very clear that there must be some aim that you have in mind for your study before you launch into the full-blown literature review, right? Uh, so what should we do? Well, the recommended uh, idea is that you formulate a research statement uh, well in advance at the beginning of your research study that addresses these six areas of concern. One is why is the top, oh, sorry, what is the topic of my study? Right? Uh, it may not be the perfect topic, it may not be uh, the finalized topic, but at least you should make an attempt at the topic well at the beginning. So your research statement should have uh, or it should contain the topic of your study. Secondly, uh, you have to say something about the relevancy of your topic, uh, its importance, or uh, how or why it is interesting. Right? Why should this literature move forward? Right? So that is something that your research statement should contain as well. Number three, how does this project relate to past researches in the field? Uh, is it going to collect more data and uh, try to go towards generalizability? Is it going to help to uh, sort of uh, do theory building for us? Uh, you know, how, how does it fit into the past research studies that exist? So the fourth thing that uh, your statement research statement should contain is the main concepts and theories that could be relevant to, to your research study. So maybe, uh, you know, postmodernism is relevant to you, or maybe sense making is relevant to you, or maybe ethnomethodology is relevant to you. So why is that relevant and how is it relevant, right? So if everybody else is using a particular theory and concept, so then, well, that's you, what you follow as well. Or you could decide that, well, everybody else has used a particular theory, so I am going to change the theory uh, because I hope that by changing the theory, I can get to find uh, or get to know something additional or something new, right? So this is something that your research statement should contain as well. And the fifth thing is that what is the aim of your literature review? Uh, are you going to basically just uh, review and tell us what exists? Are you going to uh, look at the different voices and the, uh, the anti and the pros and present uh, critiques and so forth, right? Something like that. Uh, and how does your, uh, your uh, aim of your review uh, connect with the aim of the overall research study, right? So if your aim of your research study is to uh, go and collect data and analyze it, you know, based upon certain research questions, but the review that you're doing does not facilitate that, so then pretty much you're doing the wrong type of a literature review, right? So the aim of the review should be kept in alignment with the aim of the overall research study. And the sixth item is what could be an appropriate title for the study. So in the beginning, you've got an, a topic, but here you're starting to think about 
uh, the title of the study, right? So the area of concern is uh, the topic area, and then uh, the title is basically that specific title that you're going to place on your research study. Now, how do you uh, go about identifying keywords for yourself? So, uh, the idea is that all of us are not blank slates. Uh, rather, we have you know specialized in particular areas all the way through our undergraduate and into our masters and then into our PhDs and so forth. So we already know something about that topic area or that discipline that we have. So some of the keywords can come uh, through that, but other keywords will come as you read some initial literature, some new keywords will pop up. Some of them may seem interesting and relevant, uh, and later on you may find that they're not relevant to you, so you may get rid of them. Uh, but you're basically using these existing studies and you're borrowing keywords from them and then you're thinking about your aim of your study and your topic and your title, and you're deciding upon which um, keyword to keep and which keyword to get rid of, right? So this is uh, something that uh, happens vicariously uh, through the process of reading and thinking and you know digressing and so forth. So uh, slowly and gradually you can come up with keywords, but an easy way is to sort of just uh, pick up on the keywords that exist in, in the literature and make a collection of them and then perhaps use them and then slowly and gradually decide which ones that you want to keep and which ones you want to get rid of. Right? Now, where can you get the, the relevant literature? And I'll, I'll talk specifically about peer-reviewed uh, literature. Well, for us, the HEC's digital library is a good source of information. Uh, so different days, databases like Scopus, Emerald, JSTOR, Web of Knowledge, etc. These would be the places that we will be finding our uh, predominantly uh, most of our literature from. Right, um, but with our keywords, we have to sometimes use what are known as Boolean operators. And if you can uh, think about Venn diagrams that we normally study in around class seventh and eighth, and maybe even earlier than that, uh, you'll find that there were certain uh, different logical operators that can be deployed that will help you to do your searches better, right? So words like and, or, not will be helpful. So you can say uh, trust and power, you can say trust or power, uh, or you could say trust not power, right? So in the case of trust and power, uh, both of these keywords have to exist in that source of information for it to be found by the search engine. If you say trust or power, so then either of these keywords can exist in that source of information and it would be found. But if you say trust not power, so that is going to look for articles that have the idea of trust, but if it has the idea of power in it, it's not going to be brought Forward, right, so you can sort of uh, restrict or expand the number of uh, articles that you're finding by using uh, the Boolean operators. Right? Okay. Uh, if you don't want to do a keyword-based search, then there's another search as well, which we can call uh, as the snowballing search. Uh, or tracing of citations, right? So within that, we've got two ways of doing it. One is the forward chaining and the other is the backward chaining. So if I pick an article X and I go to the very end of it, I'll find all the references. So I can go through the list of references, identify using a highlighter all those references that are relevant to me, uh, so, of course, they would have occurred before this publication. So, I'll go back in time, uh, find those articles, do the same thing, go to the very end of them, go through their list of references, select those that seem interesting, go back in time, go back in time. And eventually, I'll find that I can't go uh, any more uh, further because you know I found that person who's sort of like the seminal author or, or sort of like I, I reach a dead end, right? I'm not finding any more information. So this allows me to find out 
the chain that lead, led to that particular article. I could also do forward chaining or snowballing. In that case, I'm going to take an article and then I'm going to see who has cited that article. Uh, and then I'll pick up that article and see who has cited that article. Right? And eventually this will uh, bring us to the present and the chain will stop because the future hasn't happened as yet. So this is another way of doing a literature review, but the chances of sort of missing uh, some relevant articles are quite high because they may not exist in, in the backward chain, they may not exist in the forward chain, so there's a high chance that you miss it. So my suggestion would be to sort of use the combination of the Boolean operators and keyword-based searches and a combination of the forward and backward chaining to get to uh, most of the relevant literature that is accept, uh, that is present, um, of course, we're going to miss something because we couldn't uh, get to it, right? Um, now, you could also look at uh, existing pieces that are MS and PhD pieces, so that could also be a source of information. Uh, they aren't really, uh, you know, gray literature, but they're not really in the same uh, category as, as a peer reviewed, you know, but uh, they, they are sort of peer reviewed because they've gone through departmental reviews and there's been internal and external examiners in it and so forth, right? Uh, so they can be valid sources of information as well. And if you go to ProQuest, you'll find that there's a lot of uh, MS and PhD pieces that you could download. So that can help you in, in finding some more uh, literature that is of relevance to you. Right? Now, what should you do with this literature? Well, you should be recording something. You should be making a table as an example. And that table could have different columns. So you can have column, the first column, which is um, information about the source. The second column, which uh, describes what the study does. The third is uh, the advantages and disadvantages that have been highlighted in that study. The fourth is um, more information, you know, some web links or URLs, et cetera, or books, et cetera, that are relevant to this. Related studies, so if you find there, well, this concept relates to some other concept or this paper relates to something else. So you can put that as a column. Uh, complementary studies that are not directly related, but they sort of build upon that same idea or opposing studies that oppose what we have found, right? So th that could be sort of a table that you could be making for yourself when you are recording the information that you are downloading. Uh, once you have recorded and uh, selected uh, from all these uh, different articles that you have downloaded then uh, the more important thing is to sort of create a summary record so that you can have a quick reminder of what you have read in these uh, uh, articles so that you can structure your writing so the first thing is that we have to record uh, the name of the author and the year, right? So basically the citation. Uh, number two is that we want to record the research question or the questions that they had, the topic that was uh, of concern, the problem and main findings. So that could be the second column. The third column in our record could be the argument or the arguments that they presented. The fourth column could be about research design. So here we can note down the theories that they used, the concepts that were deployed, the methods that were used for data analysis. The fifth column could be the key references that those people, uh, those papers had. So the important references could be noted down. Uh, the fifth column is why uh, is this relevant or why is it problematic, right? Uh, so you could write your thoughts about why that research study is relevant to your own research study and or if that research study is problematic in some ways, we can write that down. And uh, seventh is any kind of comments that you want to leave for yourselves as memory reminders, right? So this uh, summary record that you are creating is basically, in a way, what we call as your research note, right? So you have engaged with the literature, you have read that particular article in such a way that you don't have to go back and reread that article, right? So we have to make sure that we're making a good enough uh, 
um, summary record for ourselves. Now, the articles that we read, we have to assess them critically because, of course, you, you remember the literature review is, is uh, formally known as a critical uh, literature review, and uh, this is what it has to contain uh, is this idea of critique, right? There must be some critique. So the question is, what kind of criticisms or critiques uh, are uh, possible that we can pass about this literature in, in our writing, right? So we can examine the claims of fact and we can critique it and say, well, is, is that fact presented uh, properly? Is that really a fact or is it uh, that the person is making it up? So where is the claim to a fact that heterogeneous uh, teams are more creative? So is that really a fact? And if so, uh, is it an established fact or not? Uh, and if that is not an established fact, then we should uh, critique it and say well, that's not correct. But if it is an established fact, so then fine, our critical assessment has evaluated and um, satisfied us that that is a correct claim of fact. There could be claims of value. For example, the more uh, profitable, the more profitable a business is, the better it can serve its customers and community. Well, who says this? Uh, and uh, why do we believe it, right? So we can uh, question these and uh, th they can be used in our critical assessment. We can be looking at claims of value. So for example, free childcare has to be expanded in order to achieve gender equality in the workplace. Um, why is that true? Uh, and how is it true, right? So that is also a critical assessment. Um, Critical assessment of claims arising from the use of concepts and interpretations. For example, claims regarding tax fraud and tax avoidance. Uh, for example, there's a claim that avoiding uh, uh, paying taxes is, is damaging to the economy of the country because the government gets poorer and poorer and they're unable to provide the services. Uh, is that a valid claim or not? Uh, and why is it valid? How has it been tested and proved, right? So should we accept it or not? Uh, claims of authority. Is there a claim, uh, you know, certain writers will say that, you know, they, they throw a big name at you and say, well, here's something that a very famous person has said. Uh, and they're sort of suggesting to us that, well, because a famous person has said it, it has to be true. So sort of like saying, because a Nobel Prize winner said it, uh, Therefore, it has to be true. Well, no, you know, people can be bluffing us or they can be presenting a fact to us, uh, uh, sort of they're uh, not a fact. They, they can be presenting their opinion to us as if it was a fact, right? So we have to make sure that claims of authority don't go uh, unexamined. Rather, we have to examine what is being claimed rather than who had claimed it, right? Or, or or how it's being presented to us, right? So I'll, I'll do a separate lecture on how to critically evaluate literature in more detail, but this is just a brief for right now. Um, and lastly, identifying uh, the themes and uh, problems that exist in, in the literature. So you can make another table, for example, and th this would be uh, highly customizable depending upon the topic area that you have. Uh, or the specialization area that you have. So you could have, for example, the author year, uh, some sort of definitional constructs that are being presented, uh, factors affecting something, something, right? So what is being said about that, main findings or, or, or so on and so forth, problem areas that you're finding and all that, right? So that could be done uh, also. But I, I think the summary records for right now are quite relevant, those are, uh, better to be done um, in, in quite detail and quite meticulously and also recording of the information uh, is also important so that you can have a database of, of your uh, info and you can all you can do all these in Mendeley you can do them in uh, EndNote or you can do them in uh, Zotero or whatever type of uh, uh, citation management software that you're using. Uh, and the last thing that uh, 
I would like to talk about is the idea of writing about your uh, literature review. Uh, well, one is plotting, the other is pantsing, if you remember. Plotting means that, uh, you know, we're not good writers, we're not natural born writers, so we should sit down, structure our writing before we uh, write. And pantsing means that, well, we're quite good at it, and so let's just wing it, and uh, there will be flow, there will be depth, and things will make sense, right? So I would definitely discourage you to do the second, which is pantsing, just writing off the cuff is not a good idea. It is a better idea to plot, which means to first read, uh, second is to conceptualize how you will put things on a piece of paper, structure it, you know, create a table of content and all the section headings and the subheadings, etc., and figure out how much uh, writing you're going to do in each of these sections, basically how you're going to distribute the uh, number of words that you want to use in your writing uh, in that literature review section. How is it going 